In 1871, the city of Paris was engulfed in bitter civil conflict. The revolutionaries of the Commune seized the French capital and 10 weeks of bloodshed ensued. When the rebellion failed, the authorities needed a scapegoat. Their choice was a famous painter, a man well known for his radical politics. In September that year, Saint-Pélagie prison received a new inmate, Gustave Courbet, the founder of realism. When he began his six-month sentence, Courbet was 52 years old. He had not been directly involved, but his links with the commune had been strong. This was enough to convict an artist who was radical not only in his views, but also in his work. His paintings of French peasants had caused outrage. Never before had such humble subjects been painted in the manner of high art. But Courbet's genius defied the critics to secure the fame that he craved. This was a man who recognized the importance of image. In his early years in Paris, he devised a brilliant public persona. Because of the nature of French society at the time, he decided to present himself as a heavy-drinking, self-taught peasant. This was hardly the truth, but Courbet's self-marketing worked. Sadly, drinking was a feature of the artist's life. In his later years, the effects of alcohol and government persecution forced him into a sick and miserable exile. But in his 58 years, he created a body of works that stand as landmarks of 19th century art. Corby was really the first artist to boldly proclaim that art should be about the here and now, and that the only genuine subject matter of art should be the artist's own experience. Probably Courbet's greatest achievement was to emphasize that the painting of the everyday was important. And not just that it was an interesting subject, but that it was as important as any other kind of painting. And this is why he liked to do it on such a monumental scale. He's also someone who I think sets up the idea of the artist um, as an individual, somebody who is very much of their own time, so that artists following on after him are able to progress is perhaps the wrong word, but develop and to create an art which is truly contemporary. I think to paraphrase one historian, he was like the bull in the china shop of uh, academic art in the 19th century. And in a way, he was, he was a great celebrator of the material, I mean, the materiality of human and natural form, but also he was a great striver for independence of the artist. And I think that's really part of his achievement. He was a magnificent landscape painter, but he was also a confrontational, a political, and a, a strident portrayer of a material reality. He revitalised um, the art of the period. It had become rather stuck in an argument between uh, romanticists and classicists. And uh, th this sort of uh, dispute um, that had gone on for so long rather failed to realise what art was really all about. And that, it, that in a sense, it was something that, that should speak to the people of the time rather than simply um, portraying events from some classical historical past or some sort of literary ideology. Um, so Corbe brought it back to where it really uh, belonged and in, in effect he gave art back to the people. Gustave Courbet's eventful life began on June the 10th, 1819 in the eastern French town of Ornon. His father, Régis, had risen from the peasantry to become a prosperous landowner. In time, his son would exploit these lower-class origins for his own public image. But as a youth, he was more concerned with learning the business of art. The young man's career intentions were becoming clear, and in 1839, 
he moved to the hub of French artistic life, Paris. It was here that the first signs of Courbet's radical approach began to emerge. At the time, it was common practice for a young would-be artist to study at the École des Beaux-Arts before securing an apprenticeship with an established master. But Courbet chose not to do this. In later years, he claimed that he was an artist who had taught himself, but that was not strictly the case. I think when you're thinking about Courbet and the extent to which he is self-taught, you have to really question the idea of what self-taught means. In technical terms, he was certainly trained because at Besançon he attended the academy. Uh, he was a student of Flachelot. And, of course, when he goes to Paris in the autumn of uh, 1839, he works for several months with Steuben and describes Steuben as his master. So in technical terms, he was very much a painter who knew what he was doing and who had the proper kind of skills training. But I suppose what was perhaps different from Courbet and many other people is you might say he took control of his own education. Um, he didn't go to the academy and go through all the hoops that students were made to go through then. He went to places where he could study from the model. He took advice from masters. But he was the person who was calling the shots. He was the person who was doing his own exploration. Courbet was passionate about the old masters and he spent hours copying their greatest works. We can detect the influence of the past in his earliest painting. Courbet himself said this image of man with a leather belt was inspired by the Spanish master Velázquez. But modern X-ray technology has revealed a different inspiration. We now know that this dark portrait was painted on top of a copy of a Louvre painting by an even greater old master, the 16th century Venetian artist Titian. The young Courbet also admired the painters of Northern Europe. In 1846, he travelled to Holland and Belgium to visit their art galleries. Courbet's genius was to take influences from the past and mould them with his own artistic spirit into great masterpieces. Courbet was very interested in the art of the past and when he went to Paris he had the opportunity through visiting the Louvre in particular of seeing the works of many of the great masters. He was particularly interested in painters who we now see as part of a realist tradition. The Spanish painters of the 17th century, painters like Velázquez for example, who although he was the court painter was also somebody painted with a tremendous frankness and directness and wonderful effects. And perhaps most of all his interest was in Rembrandt, which might surprise us a little bit more because Rembrandt isn't really very like Courbet to look at, but Courbet was fascinated by the way that uh, Rembrandt, so to speak, suggested the painting of the everyday was interesting, was, uh, it had problems about it and that there was a tremendous mastery. He wasn't obeying any of the rules, he was just going directly for what he wanted to see and that Courbet found greatly inspiring. Artists like Rembrandt, for example, themselves were influenced by earlier artists like Caravaggio um, and uh, the, the sense of the way how um, paintings had a, a rather dramatic uh, sense in the way that the lighting worked um, and also the sense of the realism of the figures. All of these artists um, were people who portrayed reality as it was um, uh, so that Caravaggio's paintings still have a modern look today. Um, and th that sense uh, was what Courbet instinctively reacted to. When Courbet visited Holland, he was 27 years old and still far from established as an artist. He struggled to have his works accepted by the Salon, the annual Paris exhibition that was still the only place to establish a reputation. One of his few paintings that was exhibited there was this image of a man with a black dog. Like many other early Courbet works, this is a self-portrait. 
The unknown artist's inability to pay for models may explain why he depicted himself so often in his early years. A sense of poverty and struggle can be seen in this self-portrait from 1845. Its title, The Desperate One, only adds to the viewer's impression of a young painter battling against obscurity and ignorance. Courbet suffered many salon rejections early in his career. By the time he was 29, he had submitted 25 paintings and 22 had been turned down. But life was not all grim. Having made his decision to be an artist, his father supported him with regular sums of money. This helped to pay for an excellent social life. Each year he returned to Ornan to enjoy the countryside of his birthplace. He painted his friends and family, including this delightful portrait of his favourite sister, Juliette. Courbet wasn't lonely in Paris either. He began an affair with a woman called Virginie Binet. In 1847, she bore him an illegitimate son, Désir, but the couple never married. There is a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Vili today. Courbet also made many friends in Paris's cultural and intellectual community. These included Charles Baudelaire, a well-known poet who sat for this Courbet portrait around 1847. Baudelaire and Courbet were just two of a group of men who met regularly at a night spot called the Brasserie Andelaire. Others included the anarchist philosopher Pierre Proudhon and the writer Jules Champfleury. At the Brasserie, this group of friends discussed a new approach to the political, intellectual and artistic issues of the day. In time, their meeting place would become known as the Temple of Realism. The Brasserie Andler was very convenient for Courbet because it's practically next door to his studio. Uh, but it did become the meeting place for many writers and also politicised figures who felt that society needed to change via democracy and egalitarianism. It's a very chaotic world. It's a very noisy, argumentative world. It's full of people with very different views um, who are bouncing ideas off one another. And in the middle of it, you have Courbet, this noisy, very uh, opinionated figure. And out of that evolves a particular, I suppose you might call it socialist view, although again it's very varied, one which is very anti-institutional and one which is looking back, I suppose, for something which is natural, which is true. Courbet's role, I think, in the um, Brasserie Andler was one in which he was really a pivotal figure. The Brasserie Andler was a vibrant centre of radical opinion. We might call it a bohemian establishment. It was now that Courbet began to establish his public persona, that of the pipe-smoking, beer-swilling peasant, the radical thinker fighting against poverty to succeed as a self-taught artist. One of the paradoxes about Courbet is he is the great realist painter, so therefore he is the painter about, look at what you see, a, call a spade a spade, be direct. And yet he was also working in a deeply capitalist society and one in which you might say the artist had to promote themselves. He is very much of that generation where artists begin to become what you might call media figures, figures who have a certain persona, have a certain cachet. And in a way you might say Corbet makes a persona out of the image of the realist artist, of the simple peasant who comes and just does things directly. Some people I would say that in fact it was a means of him being able to work within Paris while still remaining apart from it, um, putting a distance between himself and Paris. He talks himself about uh, having a mask which he puts on uh, which actually hides 
uh, a sadness and a, and a bitterness and, and a sense, I suppose, of loneliness. All artists of, the, of his generation strove to, 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 if you like, present and represent themselves as artists because artists had come to mean something very different for them than it had for generations before where art as a kind of skill had been passed on through schools, through academies, through workshops. In the 19th century period, there is a sense in which the artist has to sort of assert a particular identity as artist, an identity which means that he's separate from the bourgeois, from which, let's face it, Courbet and many of his ilk actually emerged, but in a sense not just separate from that kind of rather dominant class, but also superior in a way. Much of Courbet's image bore little resemblance to his real personality. He loved to give the impression that he was a rebel, a scourge of authority. In 1848, he had a chance to prove it. In February that year, a Paris uprising succeeded in overthrowing the monarchy of King Louis-Philippe. A new republic was proclaimed and many of the Bohemian community were involved in its creation. Baudelaire took part in the street fighting. Pierre Proudhon became a member of the new National Assembly and ended up in jail as a result when Louis Napoleon seized power in 1851 and established the Second French Empire. Courbet's contribution to the dramatic events of 1848 was minimal though he later liked to suggest otherwise. For Courbet, 1848 was far more important for the development of his art. That winter, he created his first great masterpiece, a large canvas portraying his father and three of his friends in his hometown. This is After Dinner at Ornans an image that marked the beginning of Courbet's career as a realist artist. At the time, the official salon favoured huge history paintings, depicting scenes from the Bible, mythology, or great historical events. A generation before, the Romantic painters had also made paintings of contemporary events acceptable, but a romantic masterpiece like Delacroix's Liberty Leading the People was a very different kind of painting from After Dinner at Ornon. We cannot imagine this scene happening for real. Courbet's first masterpiece was different. Over eight feet long and six feet high, its proportions were like those of a history painting. But this is just an ordinary scene of four ordinary men relaxing after a meal. At the time, this was seen as an outrage. It is said that Delacroix himself was amazed by the painting. Well, of course, one must first remember that not all critics were outraged by it. Jean Fleury enjoyed it, of course, perhaps unsurprisingly. But Yes, there were critics who were perplexed by it, and part of the central reason for that was that instead of a kind of a nice sort of controlling gaze over the kind of happy merry-making of the peasants in an interior, we have a mysterious, monumental, wistful scene in which, in a way, that the viewer is bravely confronted with a reality of which he or she is not particularly aware, a provincial reality, a class reality probably distant from their own. What struck people and outraged them in a sense most of all was its size. It wasn't so much the painting, it was all, everyone praised it, they said it was very well painted, it was a very well observed, a terrific realist technique behind the whole thing. Nobody had any problems with that. The problem was the size. It was that a picture like that, just of people sitting around a table, should take on this monumental significance. However, after dinner at Tourmont was accepted by the 1849 Salon. The work was purchased by the Republican government and Courbet was awarded a gold medal. This meant that he could now exhibit what he liked without fear of rejection. His response was a succession of Salon paintings that would make his name. At the next exhibition, 
nine of his works were displayed. Among them, another canvas that provoked an indignant response. This is The Stonebreakers, an image inspired by a real encounter with two roadside labourers some years earlier. Courbet described how he had rarely seen two human beings so miserable as they went about their monotonous toil. Yet this was the reality of daily life for many members of the labouring classes, and the artist's image is a faithful rendition of the bleakness of working life. Sadly, we only have photographs of the work, as the original canvas was destroyed in the Second World War, but we can still gain an idea of the compositional skills which the artist now possessed. I think what strikes us most about the Stonebreakers is that this is not heroic labour. There are plenty of images where these strong, muscle-bound, kind of idealised figures are working. It has a very strong kind of rhythmic effect to it, which increases its power and also the sense that something is going on, stones are being broken, some physical activity is taking place. That is all brought together in a very beautiful and powerful manner. But these are brutalised figures. Corbet realised that stone breaking was the kind of lowest of the low employment and that, if you like, within just a few years the young boy would turn into the old man. Normally in paintings like this, it, it's given a sort of gloss so that we, the public who goes to the salon and sees these paintings, isn't so fully aware of, of the harsh realities of what life is like for these people. But for Corbet, um, if anything, he would play that up. Uh, and um, this became something that, that, that the public rather objected to. When The Stonebreakers was shown at the Salon of 1850-51, to 51, few critics were concerned with the technical skills of the artist. Instead, they condemned what they saw as the sheer ugliness of the work. This peasant scene also provoked a negative reaction. Critics were simply not used to canvases depicting peasant life as it actually was. But of all Courbet's contributions to the 1850-51 Salon, none provoked a greater storm than this monumental canvas, the burial at Aumont. Its size was overwhelming, 22 feet wide by 10 feet high. Yet this is no majestic scene from history. Instead, we see a simple funeral in the artist's hometown. We know that these are images of real people. When the citizens of Aumont heard of Courbet's plans for the canvas, Many begged him to include them in the image. Those that the artist did include were painted life-size. The burial at Aumont was derided for its apparent ugliness. The two beadle figures cut an especially unimpressive figure. By painting on such a huge scale, Courbet raised the status of the common people at a time when many in the ruling classes feared the potential power of the peasantry. But, as with the Stonebreakers, the modern viewer may choose to consider the technical features of the painting, the sombre, restricted palette, and the unusually flat picture plane are recurring features of Courbet's work. It is very noticeable that many of Courbet's paintings have the figures very close to the picture plane, almost spread across as if in a frieze. Now it seems to me that this is possibly something to do with his kind of imperfect training. He wasn't very strong at creating um, perspective with figures interspersed in depth. Corbet was always criticised for the flatness of his pictures and many of the cartoons of the day emphasise this in particular. Um, now, 
I think one has to make a distinction here between what might call flatness in the sense of lack of spatial depth being shown in a picture, sort of lack of vistas, and flatness in the sense of lack of volume. Uh, Courbet's figures have a lot of volume. They're very three-dimensional. They're almost sculptural. Uh, and that solidity comes through. And I think, in a way, there are two things going on here. One is that he is wanting to emphasize the monumental, the sculptural, by not making his space too deep so that you're aware of the solidity of the figures as they lie along the plane. The other is perhaps more of a cultural point. Um, he was very much influenced in popular art. And he was interested very much in the, 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 the textures of the clothes that they wore, the implements that they used, um, the way they interacted with each other as people. And the landscape itself uh, was simply a background, as far as he was concerned, to that particular image. We may now see this amazing canvas in purely artistic terms, but there is no doubt that it was the artist's political views that intrigued many at the time. Courbet's works were scoured in search of a political subtext. This 1853 Salon exhibit provides an example. The Sleeping Spinner again features the flat picture plane and the limited palette that characterize Courbet's greatest realist work. We can also identify a dark tonality achieved by the artist's trademark use of a reddish-brown grounding on the canvas. We might also admire the tenderness with which Courbet has captured the girl's sleeping features. But why is she asleep? Is it because she is exhausted by her endless labours? Courbet suggested to his anarchist friend, Proudhon, that the spinner was a proletarian, a member of the working class identified in Marx's Communist Manifesto just five years before. Proudhon was always looking for a political message in his friend's work, and in 1855, he would have been keen to search for radical meaning in this enormous and enigmatic canvas, a Courbet image that may be his finest masterpiece, and which reveals much about the man and his work. The artist's studio. By now, the painter seen here was delighting in his status as a well-known Parisian figure. He continued to cultivate his rebellious public image. In 1853, he was asked to paint an official painting for the 1855 World Exposition. Mindful of his image as a radical outsider, he turned it down. His reputation only increased when the exposition took place. When the judging panels rejected the burial at Aumont and the artist's studio, his response was to set up an independent exhibition of his own work. It was a masterstroke that finally established the status of Courbet's realist works, the most intriguing of which was the artist's studio. This was another enormous canvas, 22 feet wide by 12 feet high. It shows Courbet in his studio, painting a landscape as a nude model looks on. On either side are two large groups of individuals. Famously, the artist described these on the right as being his friends and family. In his own words, those who live on life. To the left are a far darker group, those who live on death. To this day, the precise identity and meaning of many of these figures is debated. The work as a whole is equally enigmatic. Courbet gave it the ambiguous subtitle of a real allegory and challenged viewers to work out what it meant. New interpretations of the painting are still being made today, but there can be no doubting the value of this remarkable work of art.
The studio is literally a great painting because it is a very, very large work. It's a very bombastic work, I think, in a way. It's self-proclaiming, but necessarily so because Courbet, by that stage, was very concerned with this idea of the promotion of realism as he understood it. By about 1855, I think Courbet is becoming dissatisfied with always being called a realist. So he diversifies. The real title of the artist's studio is A Real Allegory Summing Up Seven Years of My Artistic Life. Now if you think about it, realism and allegory are incompatible. One's about the present, the here and now, the other's about fantasy. So I think Corbett is trying to disentangle himself with being too closely connected with realism and painting a subject about him and his imagination. Some of the most significant figures in Courbet's life can be seen in the artist's studio. Baudelaire on the far right. His sister embracing an unknown lover. Proudhon, the anarchist. We can also see Alfred Bruyard, a wealthy man who became Courbet's most reliable patron. By the time this great canvas was displayed, Bruyard had already purchased the sleeping spinner, as well as this canvas, another image which shocked conservative critics at the Salon of 1853. Perhaps more than any other Courbet painting, The Bathers was perceived as shockingly ugly. Delacroix was critical of the work, though he was more concerned with the lack of meaning in the canvas than the obese, unidealized form of the central female figure. But the merits of Courbet's realism were now increasingly recognized. In 1854, he painted The Winnowers, another peasant image from the artist's time. Courbet declared his intention to record the manners, ideas and aspects of the age as I saw them, to create a living art. Courbet's idea of living art was actually showing the reality of everyday existence by looking at the humble lives of country folk and also occasionally townspeople. Looking back on it now, we can see that it was, in a sense, um, a pivotal movement. Uh, if we hadn't had Corbet, a lot of these other later art movements uh, simply wouldn't have really been able to get established. Corbet was often prepared to use existing compositions in the creation of his work. The nude in the artist's studio was derived from this early photograph, while the layout of The Winnowers is believed to have been taken from the Japanese prints popular at the time. But this is an image that may also reveal something of the artist's personal life. The women here have been identified as two of his three sisters, while the boy may be his son, Désir. If so, it was the last time he appeared in a painting by his father. By the time Courbet completed this canvas in 1855, his mistress, Virginie Binet, had left him and married another man, taking her child with her. Gustave Courbet would never marry. In one of his most famous remarks, he described a married man as being a reactionary, though he did express some regret at not being able to see his son again. But he was certainly not short of female company. Once while on holiday, he claimed 2,000 women had asked to be painted by him. He enjoyed affairs with women like Madame Borou, a married woman who sat for this Courbet portrait in 1863. As his career developed, he increasingly turned to the female nude for subject matter, and images like The Woman in the Waves 
are admired for their warm, natural sensuousness. But in his letters, Courbet spoke of women as being a distraction from the serious business of life, his work. I mean, there was no question that he, he, he liked women. He uh, was sexually attracted to women and found them sexually attractive, and that he produces these very voluptuous, uh, sensual, actually very sexual pieces, very obviously almost pornographic paintings. Some have seen this as him kind of trying to shock a bourgeois public, but in a sense it also betrays, as I think as feminist scholars have seen, a certain amount of anxiety. Courbet, they see him as somehow sort of sharing some of the anxieties, the fear of women, which dominated a basically patriarchal society and which actually is the flip side of patriarchy. One might say that he was profoundly in love with himself and perhaps one might say he was too much in love with himself to share himself with anyone else and perhaps this means that he never has that kind of sharing relationship. What is clear is that Courbet's single life was full and stimulating. From the early 1850s onwards he travelled widely across Europe promoting exhibitions of his own work, as well as finding time for recreation. In 1858-59, to 59, he spent the winter in Frankfurt, where he particularly enjoyed stag hunting. The inspiration for this dark-toned canvas, which was a huge success at the Salon two years later. In 1861, when this canvas was shown, Courbet was in the prime of his life. That year he found time to set up a teaching studio of his own in Paris. The advice he gave his students on the purpose of painting can be seen as a summary of his artistic beliefs. I maintain that painting is an essentially concrete art and can only consist of the representation of real and existing things. It is a completely physical language, the words of which consist of all visible objects, an object which is abstract, not visible, non-existent, is not within the realm of painting. I think Courbet's realism is a product of his countryside environment in Ornon, and it's also a belief that Painting shouldn't be about escapism, it shouldn't be about fantasy, but it should be an affirmation of life as it's lived. He was deeply influenced by the wider cultural realist movement, which was so um, popular in the 1840s, so much associated with radical policies, uh, looking at society in a fresh and analytical way. And in the 1850s, um, when he's becoming a more established figure, becoming a bit more popular, he, perhaps he needs to show that he is somebody who has a theory too. So he turns it into a theory. And I think in some ways you might say it was a way of developing his own role, his professional role as a painter. Courbet, when asked to explain his kind of realism, um, would come out with statements like, well, if you want me to paint an angel, show me one. Courbet's teaching studio only lasted for a few months. By 1862, he was away from Paris once more, enjoying the hospitality of his friend, Etienne Baudry, near the town of Saintes. It was during this stay in Saintes that he enjoyed his romantic liaison with Madame Borou, and this portrait of her was completed the following year. He also executed a number of still-life paintings. Baudry was a keen botanist, and the flower scenes that Courbet painted are some of the best loved of his entire work. By now, Courbet was virtually avoiding the peasant images with which he had made his name. Increasingly, he turned his hand to genre painting. Nudes such as Woman with a Parrot took up much of his time. It was a huge success at the 1866 Salon, and surviving letters prove that the artist was ecstatic with the acclaim his work received. He also painted landscapes, 
and his portrait commissions included this striking 1865 image of Monsieur Naudelet, the Elder. His work continued to grow in popularity. But many critics now feel that Courbet's later genre work does not reach the artistic heights of his earlier masterpieces. When he painted the artist's studio, Courbet, in a sense, came to the peak of his career. You might say this is the way in which he developed most as a programmatic painter, a painter of large-scale realist subjects, subjects which were groundbreaking by giving an importance to subjects that they had not had beforehand. His technique evolved in landscape painting and figure painting um, throughout his life and I think it's to, to, to sort of see him only as of interest and excitement up until 1855 is to rather underestimate the, uh, the, the complexity and the variety of his work after that time. One man who felt that Courbet's later work was in decline was a then struggling young artist from Le Havre. His name was Claude Monet. The two men were acquainted, and Monet may have been aware of Courbet's increasing problems with alcohol in the late 1860s. But in the final year of that decade, as Monet and Renoir gave birth to Impressionism at La Grandouillère near Paris, Courbet was on the Normandy coast at Etretat. The old realist master was not finished yet. That summer, he painted a series of canvases that proved that his artistic powers were still intact. Once again, he turned his attention to genre work, in this case, seascapes. Like other artists before and since, he was inspired by the rugged cliffs and coastlines of the Etretat region. The results were some of the best images of his later career. This canvas, entitled The Cliff After the Storm, gives us a flavour of Courbet's seascape work. Cliffs at Etretat had this very famous geological feature, this rock arch and Courbet captures that, but he also captures the effects of the weather, so the change um, in the weather after this great storm and the kind of cleansing effect that the good weather's having on the environment. You could be standing on that beach, you could be sensing the, the sea air, you could be hearing the sound of the waves, because you are brought close up to the sea itself, and that is the main subject of the painting. You're not given a little narrative scene to lead you in. You don't need that because the power and the force of nature is something which he is he's dealing with directly. As the 1870s dawned, the painter of this calm yet dramatic scene was a 50-year-old man of wealth and fame. But Courbet's fortunes were about to take an unfortunate and irreversible turn. Rheumatism and alcohol abuse began to take their toll on his body, but he was still capable of making a defiant public gesture. In June 1870, he was offered the Legion of Honour by the French imperial government. He rejected it, explaining that art did not need the formal approval of the state. But his decision to turn down the award would lead indirectly to the artist's imprisonment and eventual exile. In July 1870, the Franco-Prussian War broke out. Following the French defeat just weeks later, the country was plunged into chaos, culminating in the ten revolutionary weeks of the Paris Commune of 1871. Courbet's snub to the pre-war government was remembered favourably during this time. As a result, he became president of the Republican Arts Commission and then a member of the Commune itself. On May the 16th, the revolutionaries made an order for the Place Vendôme column to be toppled. Though Courbet was not directly involved in the decision, 
This photograph shows him clearly beside the fallen monument. Twelve days later, the commune fell, and ten days after that, Courbet was arrested. The new government needed a high-profile scapegoat for the column's destruction, and the self-styled rebel Courbet fitted the bill perfectly. In September 1871, he began a six-month sentence at Saint-Pelagie prison. After his release from custody in March 1872, he returned to his hometown of Aumont. But he was now increasingly ill with rheumatism and a liver disease that his alcoholism did nothing to help. Persecution by the government also continued. In 1873, Courbet was ordered to pay for the reconstruction of the Place Vendôme column. The sum eventually demanded was 323,000 francs. It was a harsh judgment that the artist had no intention of complying with. In July 1873, he left France for Switzerland. He would never return. Despite his sadness and his increasing ill health, Courbet continued to paint while in exile. A visit from his father inspired this dignified portrait. While this view of the sunset on Lake Geneva confirmed that his seascape skills were still present. In early 1877, Courbet contracted the kidney disease, dropsy. He died on December the 31st that year in the Swiss town of tour le -Pelz. He was 58 years old. I think those who have wished to explore modern art in all its diversity and all its new uh, political, ideological and social concerns have seen Courbet as an extremely important artist, someone who ran against, so counter to academic convention, who in a way smashed up the ground and, and, and allowed the rebuilding of painterly tradition and progress on the ruins of the academic system, if you like, by, by flouting the hierarchy of genres, by confronting his viewers. In many ways, you could almost say that modern art starts with Courbet because of his insistence on the artist's experience as being law. It's not just a matter of what you do, it's a matter of where you do it. And I think what, in a sense, makes Courbet the first of the moderns is not just that he is the realist innovator, somebody who brings a new dimension to paint, uh, but he does it in Paris, he does it centre stage, he does it in a place where it's not just going to lead to a new kind of painting, but it's going to change the practice of painting altogether. And in that sense, I think that is his great achievement.